All right. Well, good evening, folks. Here we are at uh, our mid-September local history guild. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank thank everybody for coming uh, out this evening. Um, we have a uh, we you know every now and again on the local history guild we do get a heavy hitter scholar um, and uh, and uh, that's what we have tonight. We have uh, Charlotte Carrington Farmer, who is a uh, associate professor of history at Roger Williams University. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Charlotte has uh, done a lot of different local history, well, a lot of dis different important chunks of New England history. You know, I mean, a a as we know, you know, New Bedford and, and uh, other New England port cities, local history could actually start in New Zealand uh, and, uh, and still matter um, or Japan and still matter. Uh, in this case, you know, it could start in Barbados and still matter um, as, a, as a local history topic because, you know, local history people, local people jumped on ships and they sailed from place to place and they did things and then they came back sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, that what they did and who those people were uh, is all part of, well, it's part in this case, you know, it's part of a, a whole Atlantic history, um, Caribbean history, and, you know, in a whaling topic, it's, it's a global history. Uh, but it all it all comes right back to uh, to the seaport of origin. Um, so um, so Charlotte has written on Slatersville. She's written on Native Americans and presented on Native American history. She's uh, uh, presented on um, Roger Williams' wife, Mary Williams, which sounded like a pretty interesting uh, topic. And, um, you know, is published in uh, the South County History Center, Rhode Island History Journal, the New England Quarterly. Um, and uh, has chapters uh, coming out already out in the Equine Atlantic, New England's Horse Trade to the West Indies in the 18th century and other books. We were just uh, sort of uh, chatting a little bit uh, beforehand, you know, about uh, all of the various um, important publications that um, that uh, Dr. Carrington Farmer is contributing to. Um, so uh, what do you think, Charlotte? Um, what do you want to talk about this evening? Yeah, well, firstly, thank you so much to New Bedford Whaley Museum for hosting me and for that really great introduction. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about um, work that I've already done, but work that is still in progress. And so I'm going to talk to you about a project that's called Equine Atlantic that, is, as you just said, is all about New England's horse trade mainly in the 18th century, but a little bit in the 17th and certainly into the 19th century down to the sugar colonies in the West Indies. And as you say, this is New England's maritime connection through a different lens, right? Through an animal history lens. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit of um, like my background. Uh, I'm gonna give you, I've got probably maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes of presentation prepared. Some of it's kind of formal, some of it's more informal. I really want to give you a sense of the different primary sources that I've studied to get to this point to be able to tell you this history because you know one of the things I always think about is like how do people know that and the honest answer is an insane amount of archival research all around New England in the UK and then down in the Caribbean um, and still always finding more sources so I want to share some of those sources with you uh, but I really do want to leave plenty of time for kind of informal conversation and so um, please do think of some good questions for me. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, if you know I'm sharing my screen I can't always see if people have their like hands up and things like that so feel free to um, interrupt as need be so bear with me one second. Um, all right perfect. All right so as I said to you then I'm going to talk to you about this project that I've got tentatively titled as Equine Atlantic uh, New England's horse trade to the West Indies in the 18th century. Um, so let me just give you an overview of, of what Michael was saying. So I've already published quite a bit on this uh, and I'll share these um, links in the chat afterwards. I published um, a journal article in 2018 called The Rise and Fall of the Narragansett Pacer, which is a particular breed of horse that originates in Rhode Island in the late 17th and into the 18th century. Um, I published a book chapter on um, New England's trade to the West Indies a couple of years ago. Um, I have a monograph that is in progress, and I also have two publications that are going to come out next year. One 
called Equine Atlantic with um, Oxford University Press and then another one on mule breeding, um, which is weird and wonderful that I never thought I would do. New England's mule trade, mainly in the late 18th and 19th century, that's coming out with Manchester University Press in the new year. Um, in terms of how I've been able to do this research, um, I've been really lucky with the funding I've received. I received a New England Regional Fellowship Consortium Award to be able to do all of the New England research um, for this. And then the Roger Williams University um, Professional Development, but also the Provost Office has supported my travel down to Barbados and J Jamaica. So it really has been, I think I've been working on this project for nine years at this point and the book is almost done and the chapters are still coming out so it really is um, a big piece of research that I'm excited to share with you. So let's start in the 17th century then. Um, horses in New England. So we have the first written record of horses arriving in New England in 1629 when Francis Higginson records how 13 horses come into Massachusetts Bay. Um, and really, from the get go, they have this idea that they are going to export horses for trade. And so this is something that I think is really important. This export, this maritime element of horse breeding is not something that just develops in the 18th century. It has very firm early to mid 17th century origins. It seems in New England, there's no real need for draft horses. Uh, you know, they tend to use oxen for that purpose. They use horses for travel, but really they're breeding draft animals solely for export. And we get a sense of that from a primary source that John Hull writes in 1672. And this is a quote you see on the screen. He says, you know, if we procure a very good breed of large and fair mares and stallion, that no mongrel breed might come amongst them, we might have a very choice breed for coach horses, saddle and draft horses, and in a few years might draw of considerable numbers and ship them for Barbados, Nevis or other such parts of the Indies. Mm. So this shows really from the 17th century, New Englanders have this maritime element to their horse breeding. They're not just breeding horses to keep them here for riding and for you know drawing coaches. They are thinking immediately of shipping them down to the West Indies. And I just want to kind of come back to this, this image then. And I want to, after we've set this 17th century context, just start with a story that I think encapsulates why New Englanders are shipping these horses and also some of the dangers. So I want to start kind of this narrative piece in July 1732. And in July 1732, Captain Crow loaded, loaded up his sloop and he set sail out of Rhode Island and headed down to the West Indies, specifically to St. Christopher. So Crow's cargo um, had livestock on board um, and amidst that livestock, there were 16 horses and all of these horses traveled on the deck of the ship. So they're not below deck, they're on the deck. Um, however, Crow and his horses never made it to St. Christopher. After around a month at sea, they were hit with, quote, a very hard gale of wind off Bermuda, which overset the sloop and quickly cleared the deck of its cargo. And whilst the horses put up a really valiant effort and struggle to swim, they were quickly carried out to sea and drowned. Crow and his crew were up, uh, clung to the sloop and, quote, were almost up to their middle in water for 36 hours before they cut away the mast which righted the vessel. They continued in, quote, a most dis distressed condition, living on their raw and wet provisions for 19 days. And they were, quote, in the hazard of perishing when they were met with divine providence when fellow Rhode Islander Captain Jonathan Remington took them in and delivered them to safety. So Crow Sloop was one of the many New England ships that braved the dangerous aquatic highway that was the 18th century Atlantic in a quest for delivering horses to the sugar colonies. And so tonight I want to talk to you about how horses cross the Atlantic, why they cross the Atlantic, why they were you know, carried on the deck and not below, and talk to you about some of the dangers in making that journey. So as we heard then, this is starts in the 17th century. New England has an eye on the export business from the get-go. Um, 
And as I mentioned in the introduction, one of the things that also happens in the 17th century is New Englanders start to breed horses. They import horses in from Europe, but they start to crossbreed some of those horses. And at some point in the late 17th century, Rhode Island um, comes up with what some equine historians would call the first American breed of horse, which is known as the Narragansett Pacer. Um, I don't have any contemporary sources to show you. So this is very much uh, a secondary source that comes from South County History Center that shows what a Narragansett Pacer would have looked like. Um, most of them were this kind of chestnut sorrel color. Uh, and the, what made them so special is the way that their legs moved. So you can see this horse's front right leg is forward, his back right leg is forward. And they moved their legs because of the way their kind of um, backbone was structured. So they could cover ground, they could cover 50 to 60 miles a day without tiring um, the rider and tiring themselves and there are so many primary sources that describe how these were the number one horses for riding for saddle purposes in the 18th century and they were sent all around the world um, and so not only are they breeding horses for draft work to work on the sugar plantations they're also breeding these riding horses and you know the Narragansett Pacer goes extinct probably by the mid 19th century um, and I can happily talk more about the Narragansett Pacer if anyone's interested in the Q&A. So the, the image I had on the opening slide I think encapsulates how central horses were to the maritime world of New England in the 17th, 18th and into the 19th century. Um, so the image that you see on the screen, um, again, is, is on display at South County um, History Center. And if you haven't seen it in real life, it's huge. It takes up the whole wall. So I strongly encourage you to go. Uh, and I think this picture shows three things that I think are really important to this particular work, right? Obviously, first and foremost, it, it centers literally in the painting how important horses were to the economy of New England in, in the 18th century. And I think sticking on that equine first theme, it shows the two different types of horses that New Englanders were raising. So the enslaver here, he's pointing his finger, you know, he, the horse he's riding and the, this one here where my mouse is waggling the, that the enslaved man is holding, they're riding horses. They're really fine. They're probably Narragansett paces with the collar. You know, we can't see that for sure because we can't see their legs. But my guess is that the, the show in the riding horses, or some of which were exported. But it's also showing this horse here that's thicker, heavier set. It's got a bigger neck. It's got thick um, feathers and the bottom is his feet. So this is one of the draft horses that would have been really no use to keep here in New England. And it shows how they're breeding not only riding horses, but draft horses solely for export. So I think that's the first thing, the role of horses. And it really places them central and how important they are to the maritime industry. I think the second thing that this painting does really well is it shows how important enslaved labor was to all of the economies that drove New England in the 17th, 18th and into the 19th century, which is, is slavery. So the horses were raised um, on plantations around New England, particularly in Connecticut and also in um, Rhode Island, but elsewhere too. And they were raised by enslaved peoples. And this picture shows how this is connected to other livestock industries, such as sheep, uh, cattle, cheese making. Um, and so it shows this interconnectedness of the um, of the different industries and how central and slave labor was. And again, I think the third piece that this shows is, you know, having the, the ship in the background, it shows that this was not an internal trade that from the get go, they have this external vision in mind for all of these products they're producing in New England. So from the get go then, they were breeding horses for a maritime pursuit to go on the ships to be sent down to the West Indies. And New Englanders, uh, when they were breeding horses, had this directly connected to several different trades. So New Englanders sent a whole bunch of plantation provisions down to the West Indies when they were sending the horses. They didn't just send a ship full of horses on those same ships. When we look at the um, ship log books and the merchant account books, they're sending fish, foodstuffs, like building supplies, timber, boards, staves. They're sending horses. They're also sending cattle. They're sending like 
oxen and pigs and sheep. Um, and then in return, this connects to the other currents of empire and, and trade, and they're receiving sugar, rum, molasses, and dye stuff. So the main reason why New Englanders are sending horses down to the sugar colonies is because from the mid 17th century onwards, sugar is one of the most lucrative things that drives empire and rival empire buildings between England, um, the Dutch, the French, um, and they're growing those sugar plantations in the West Indies, but all of those plantations have to be provisioned and supplied. And, and New England for the England for the British sugar colonies is perfectly located. So breeding horses for export and sending them on the ships down to the Caribbean is tied to these wider markets and currents for sugar um, and rival empire building. Now, as we'll see later on this evening, horses play several different roles in New England and also down in the Caribbean, but the main purpose they serve is working on the horse mills, and I'll show you a picture of one of these, and they're literally working with enslaved people, turning um, the rollers to crush the sugar cane. And what's really fascinating and what my research has shown, and to a surprising extent even to me, is that New England, especially Rhode Island before the Revolutionary War and Connecticut after the Revolutionary War, is the epicenter of equine breeding for export down to the Caribbean. So it's not just a side business, it is a central business. And you know, people far and wide describe how important this industry is of exporting animals um, across the Atlantic to New England. And so one of the questions I often get is like, well, why didn't sugar planters in the West Indies, right, on in Barbados or Jamaica or wherever it might be, why didn't they just breed their own horses? And there's a couple of reasons. Um, horses aren't ready to work until they're around four. So that means you've got four years of paying for and keeping a horse when you're not getting any work from it. Um, also, acreage is limited. If you've got spare like land in the sugar colonies, you're going to plant sugar or something else. That so you wasn't what they were doing down there. That, that wasn't what they were doing down there. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't what they were doing down there. They weren't raising horses down there. They were. They yeah. were. Yeah, exactly. They're planting cash crops. That's how they make their money. And that's they're not just importing horses, they import the food too. Um, so there are some cases. Um, I spent some time in Jamaica last year. Um, and in Jamaica, there is um some effort to breed animals, but it's even in Jamaica where they have a breeding program in a way that other colonies don't, it's never enough. They're constantly needing to import horses um, from, from New England. And so, as I say, one of the main roles that horses play when they get shipped from New England down to the Caribbean is they're working directly, again, with enslaved people on the plantation crushing the sugar. Um, they don't always use horses. Sometimes they use oxen. Uh, sometimes they use mules. Um, and there are so many letters from sugar planters describing the benefits Bits of each animal um you know some planters don't use animal at all they they use wind and again it varies from place to place and time to time so horses are just part of this bigger piece of empire so i want to just kind of make a point then about how central this trade was to new england um by 1680 rhode island's governor stanford wrote quote the principal matters which we export which are exported among us is horses and provisions and really, when he writes that in 1680, what happens in the next few years by the time we hit the turn of the 18th century is the French sugar colonies grow and bloom. The Dutch sugar colonies grow and bloom. And so New England is not only exporting horses down to the British sugar colonies, they are doing this this trade too to the French and Dutch. And this is one of the big pieces of um, my book that it's going to talk about is how upset um, the British Parliament and, and uh, British planters were, so British Parliament in England and the planters down in Barbados and um, Bermuda and, and other places, um, how they're really annoyed that they're sending horses to the French colonies and the Dutch colonies. And they write endlessly about if New England just stops sending horses to the French colonies and the Dutch, we're going to have the best empire in the world. So again, it shows how important this, this trade was. And so by 1700, as the statistic said, the ship, the statistic says shipping had increased sixfold and horses are being sent from New England 
all over to Jamaica, Barbados, Nevis, St. Christopher, Suriname. Um, and I'll show you an image of the primary source in a second. And going through the Secretary of Customs record in London, in one year alone, New England is sending 7,310 just to particular ports in the West Indies. Now, in a minute, I want you to just keep your eye on Suriname, the Dutch colony of Suriname in South America, because I want to make a point about Suriname. But for now, I want to just give you a sense of like what these records look like. So, you know, remember me saying that, um, you know, they're not just sending horses alone. Um, you can see here that in the livestock section, and um, this is from um, the West Indies records at Massachusetts Historical Society, they're also sending cattle. Um, they're also sending poultry. Um, and, you know, so you get a sense of how this this fits in. Um and I want to just go back to that Suriname point. So this is from um, the present state of the sugar plantations considered, but more especially that of the island of Barbados. This came out in, um, oh. oh, I think my screen share stopped. Hold on. Uh, let me just go ahead again. I don't know what happened there, sorry. All right, perfect. Um, so this piece then was published in 1714 and it was one of, I don't know how many, many pamphlets that um, planters published in the British sugar colonies that were horrified by the sheer number of horses that New Englanders were sending down to the Dutch in Suriname. And this is what they wrote. I'll read the quote to you. Some inspections may be necessary into the trade from New England to Suriname. To the last, they, they send horses by which they carry on their sugar mating, which promotes that Dutch colony in that manufacture. There's a law or order in Suriname that these northern vessels, so these, um, you know, New England and New York vessels, shall not be admitted to trade with them unless they bring such a number of horses. So um, in my book, I have a whole chapter on the trade from New England to Suriname to the Dutch. Um, I spent several weeks in the National Archives at Kew in London, uh, not last summer, the summer before, um, going through the colonial office files. Um, and one of the things that really came to light was this, this trade with, with Suriname. Um, and again, I want to show you some of the, the sources that I've used. So, you know, they, they do uh, such uh, to, to Suriname, right? Which, um, so they're talking about Suriname, you can see this here. Um, and basically what they're doing is, you know, by exporting small wild horses, not for service here, nor sellable in our own English plantations. So essentially that the New Englanders make this point that, the horses that they're sending to Suriname, they're only sending whatever's left, these small white wild horses. Um, and because Suriname is so desperate for horses, they can't really get them from anywhere else and they really favor horse sugar mills. This is what New Englanders are doing. So again, I feel like this inter colonial rival trade based on, on sugar production that relies on animals is something that has been really overlooked so far, I think, in what historians have written. Now I get to study some really cool sources, like stuff like this is good, but it's a little bit dry. Um, and I've spent a bunch of time out um, in Kentucky at the International Museum of the Horse, going through horsemanship manuals. So, you know, I'm thankfully uh, a horse person myself. This whole project came about because I flew my own horse across the Atlantic when I moved here 11 years ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it got me thinking about how did Pegasus cross the Atlantic? <laughs> yeah, she came in an aeroplane. <laughs> um, I wish it was Peg Pegasus, it would have been cheaper. Um, she came in an aeroplane and it really got me truly thinking, like, how did they move horses around in the 17th and 18th century? So I got to spend a bunch of time um, out in Kentucky reading horsemanship manuals, you know, figuring out like what, how did people care for horses on, on the ships, actually, one of the primary sources I'll share with you later is um, ship log books where they're recording how they're caring for the horses um, on the ship. So uh, these horsemanship manuals are fascinating as a source. Um, and I think, again, you get this sense then that this trade with the West Indies is also part of systems of power and oppression and African enslavement. And this New England report to the Board of Trade from 1740s, I think this quote really sums this up. They said, you know, the West Indies have likewise reaped great advantage from our trade by being supplied with lumber of all sorts suitable for building, 
houses, they're for building sugar works, making casts, beef, pork, flour, and other provisions. We are daily carrying to them with horses to turn their mills and vessels for their own use. And our African trade often furnishes them with slaves for their plantations. So, you know, this trade in horses is central to the, the trade in enslaved peoples too. And I think it's not just the trade. You know, we need to be really mindful that the people raising these animals in New England were often enslaved. And you know, I put a, a, an advert from the Newport Mercury from 1764 up here. You know, you've got, quote, a valuable Negro man who understands all sorts of husband, husbandry business. So from the work I've done, we can see enslaved Africans working on the on the farms around New England, not just raising horses, but you know, tending to the sheep and the oxen and the poultry as well, getting them ready for export. So horses were used in different ways uh, in the uh, West Indies as ways to oppress uh, enslaved people. You can see here an enslaver here chasing freedom seekers, um, using a horse as a way of oppressing them. And again, I can talk more about the connection of this research um, and slavery and systems of power in the Q&A, but this is a, a slightly later early 19th century image. But again, it shows you know, white enslavers using horses as a way to show dominance and power whilst enslaved peoples are literally running after and holding on to the horses. And again, horses are used in all kinds of different ways, not just crushing the mills, but um, they're also used alongside oxen and donkeys and mules uh, to transport uh, sugar and other cash crops to the port, again, to connect back to this maritime trade. So I want to just share one, one more story um, with you and then I'll kind of offer some concluding mark, remarks and then we'll take some questions. So I want to give you a, another little case study um, and I want to come back to um, Rhode Island. So one of the first places I started um, when I was doing this project, probably nine years ago now, was I spent a bunch of time at the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. Uh, and one of the first families I looked at who were involved in the horse trade um, were the Brown families. Um, and so James Brown and his son, Nicholas Brown, and you can see an advert from the Providence Gazette there, were really important players um, in the shipment of horses to the Dutch colony of Suriname, right? So what's fascinating of this advert, right? They want to buy immediately a few Suriname horses. So they have just got their eye on that particular trade, which is fascinating and they're advertising for shipping horses. So um, let's go back a little bit uh, further though. In 1739, James Brown wrote to his agent, Sal Cutter, quote, I beg you would get me 10 or a dozen Suriname horses. I hope you will not fail me for I shall depend on you. And so the letters at the JCB give a really specific expectations for what these Suriname horses looks like. And he said, quote, I want some horses that are in good case fit for shipping that are worth between seven and 14 pounds. Mares will do if they're, you know, in good shape. Um, they must be between three and eight years of age all of the horses had to be um what we would classify as ponies 14 hands so that's um 143 centimeters from the floor to where their withers are so from here to here so they're small um small enough to turn the sugar mills um in good fit good health fat free from lameness with two good eyes and good teeth and so between 1764 and 1766 like I did some calculations, the Brown sourced out 255 horses to ship to Suriname alone. They purchased the goods with um, a mix of um, goods and money. Uh, and again, you can see one of the letters on here. So in 1765, Nicholas paid um, $12 a piece for good Suriname horses. And this letter, I think, is really fascinating. So, you know, he makes this, uh, they make this agreement to buy 40 horses that are, you know, are fit for the Suriname market. And, you know, they pay for them in uh, a mix of, um, you know, different currency. They're paying in rum, sugar, molasses. And I think this letter is just so powerful because they're also paying in one, quote, Negro girl, spelled G-A-R-L. So again, we see this letter shows the market just for Suriname, they're looking directly to export them. It shows the interconnectedness of horse trade with all of these other businesses 
and how central enslaved lives and labor are to this issue too. And so whilst the Brown family specifically concentrated on the Suriname market, other merchants such as um, Newport merchant Godfrey Malbone shipped horses all over the Atlantic world. And in just a nine year period that I did a little micro history focus on from 1729 to 1738, Malbone sent out 84 vessels carrying 1,601 horses. He sent the most 17 vessels to Jamaica, followed by 15 to Barbados. Uh, and his account book, which you see on the screen, documents a purchase price for the horse, the cost he pays to keep the horses well before they're shipped. You know, the price of hay uh, to send with the horses on the voyage, um, the Indian corn, the oats, the bran, the like water containers that he's going to send on the ship with them and like halters that the horses will wear on the ship. And so Malbone's vessels left roughly once or twice a month. And on average, each vessel did two trips per year. On average, the voyage took around a month, give or take. He flavored um, sloops and he used 17 sloops for horse transport. He shipped horses on six brigantines, three ships, one snow, uh, and one schooner. Uh, the sloops typically carried between 20 to 40 horses, although on a few of the voyages I looked at, the numbers were low, as low as seven. The brigantines typically carried the same, normally 20 or so horses. Um, and then, you know, comparing Malbone to others, others shipped up to 50 horses at once. Um, and the most that Malbone shipped was 40 at once on the sloop, the Diamond, again, to Suriname in October, 1734. And I think, I chose Malbone as a case study, case study this evening because I think his preference for vessel types was echoed around New England, and most merchants use sloops or brigs um, with 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 some variation. Now, what's fascinating is that. Um, sorry, the horses were actually carried on deck um, and they were protected by this temporary awning. And so on top of that awning that they would take down when they got to the West Indies, they would put the hay and the water on top of that. So what that basically means is any time they hit bad weather, the first thing to go would be the provisions, the hay and the water for the horses. And then the horses themselves are, are, are exposed to the element under these temporary awnings. And so... As the 18th century progresses and we see a diversification in equine breeding to include mules, the choice of ships also change. We see some larger square rigged ships with uh, more ample deck space specifically designed to facilitate this transportation of larger numbers of horses. Um, and this becomes more common after the Revolutionary War where the trade shifts down to uh, Connecticut, particularly to New London. Um, and what's fascinating is Rhode Island seems to dominate this trade up until the American Revolution. And when the British occupy Newport, a lot of this trade shifts south to Connecticut. And after the Revolutionary War, Connecticut emerges as, as the epicenter um, of this trade. Um, and as we heard, I think, in the opening stories, um, this was a really risky business. Um, and I think it also shows, going back to my earlier point, how interconnected um, this story is with the history of enslavement. And I just wanted to share this quote with you because I think I think it really does need to be hammered home. So um, writing from Barbados in the mid 17th century, um, Richard Legion describes, quote, the planters by them enslaved peoples out of the ship where they find them stark naked and therefore cannot be deceived in any outward informity. They choose them as they do horses in a market. The strongest, youthfulest and most beautiful yield the greatest prices. And so we get this sense of how non-human animal property and human property are often treated one of the same and you know there's a bunch of work that's been done on the dreaded comparison and on this and I think it's really obvious at times when we're thinking about this and you know this this idea of breeding quote uh, enslaved labor and horses is is a really uncomfortable truth that that this research um deals with so one of the things I wanted to just wrap up with a couple of more primary sources so uh, one of the things that happens is um, just like any cargo, I guess, if you're crossing an ocean, especially you've got it up on deck, is you ensure that. And so I spent quite a bit of time looking at um, 
insurance records for how they're insuring the horses, you know, what policies they're carrying as they cross the Atlantic, um, you know, how you claim um, if you if, if you lose a horse. Um, one of the things they do is they have to save the hoof of the horse to prove that they actually lost the horse. And so there are some really gruesome accounts in uh, merchant account books such as this that describe when a horse dies, they basically chop it up and just save the skin and the hoof. Uh, and that's mainly for insurance purposes. Uh, an account book such as the one you see on the screen from Mystic Seaport describe in rich detail daily life on a vessel caring for horses. And, you know, truthfully, um, it's it's horrifying. In addition to, you know, bad weather and the horses being cast away and drowning at sea to horses starving because they've lost all their hay in the middle of a voyage, uh, horses get sick. And so there are accounts of horses just, you know, dying in such volumes with a sheep that the whole ship stank um horses if they're on the top deck like in bad weather falling through to below deck horses breaking their legs and they're str stringing them from the, the 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 main mast and the beams to try and keep them upright um and so it really is um a difficult business and you know why again going back to that point why would you have to do this um, and the answer is money, right? Like it, even in spite of all the dangers of crossing the Atlantic, it's more profitable for planters to import these animals, even with the risks associated than, than wasting valuable acreage um, breeding them. So as I say, they crossed the Atlantic on deck in what they described as a temporary awning. Again, those ship uh, log books have been a rich resource for me on that. Um, they describe how at the start of the voyage, they put the temporary awning up for the horses. Um, you know, normally it's around eight foot. And on top of that, the food and water are stored. The animals are tacked really tightly. They're tightly. They stand on the deck of the ship tied parallel with their heads facing each other. Really, for most of the accounts, I've seen standing for the duration of the voyage. Horses can sleep standing up, but they don't get that deep REM sleep. So they must have been really exhausted by the, the time they get there. And, you know, contemporary accounts describe how horrific it was for the animals to cross the Atlantic. Uh, and as I said, sickness, drowning, accidents. Um, it really is um, unpleasant. And so um, one of the things that happens towards the end of the 18th century is, um, and into the 19th, is New Englanders start to breed mules. And I put this up because it's one of my favorite primary sources, um, because the bit of the document I actually really needed is missing. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I wrote a blog post for Newport Historical Society on this particular source, but it shows here at the bottom that they're starting to diversify their breeding to include mules. And you see here, it says there are mules bred somewhere near you. So we see that the market for the West Indies is driving the types of animals that New Englanders are breeding. And as I say, I've got this book chapter coming out next year with the Manchester University Press that looks at how they start to breed mules specifically to export to the plantations in the Caribbean because they're really wanting mules, not horses. Mm. And again, thinking about that connection, like how are they getting um, the jackasses to start the mule breeding and where are they coming from? So there's another piece of, of maritime history on the importation of, of male donkeys to start this. So this is the publication I was telling you about, the um, shipping horses. Um, I can share that link in the chat. Um, uh, the This is the Narragansett Pacer piece. Um, that's the exhibit. This is the book chapter I published. Um, uh, you can see my chapter here, Trading Horses in the 18th Century. Um, and I'll hold on that one because I will talk about that later. Um, so I'll start my screen share there. Um, I talked a bit longer than I anticipated, but I'll happily take some questions. And please do remind me before we go to tell you about the amazing event that is happening in September, at the end of September. Well, that's quite a snapshot, isn't it, of, of you know, the what, Amer what maritime culture actually was and you know I, I i really appreciate your work uh and sharing of the sources because it it it, it clearly demonstrates how how connected the economies were uh it also 
to my mind, um, anticipates these questions of freedom that Americans kept hollering about, uh, you know, that that um, spawned the American Revolution. You know, this idea that, you know, from the American point of view, you know, we have our ships, we have our, our commodities, we'll trade with whoever we please. And you know, it's actually funny you say that because I was reading these sources, these parliamentary petitions um, from the 1710s, right? Yeah. Not the 1730s, 40s, the 1710s, like 1717, 1718, where like New Englanders are like, we just want to trade with whoever we want. Like, you know, and it's, I, I remember reading them thinking, did horses cause the American Revolution? I mean, that's a stretch. That's not well, I mean, that, that's not that's not the deal. I mean, the deal with the Massachusetts Bay Colony <laughs> was not that you trade with whoever you want to. You yeah. know, and, yeah, I think you know that 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 the you know that the 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 distance of three thousand miles away, but you know, had a lot to do with that. But but the the dynamic that you describe and that you know that that was the West Indies. British, French, Dutch, uh, you know, uh, incur encouraged smuggling. I mean, you know, it, you know, if you could, okay. if you could, if you could, you know, if you could trade your goods uh, anywhere, you trade them anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And and you know, Suriname in particular. You know, there's that very famous painting of the of the of the New England merchants cavorting, you know, cavorting in the drinking house in, in Suriname. Uh, they weren't they weren't really supposed to be doing that were they no and that's true and so what i didn't say is that um following the ship log books and the merchant account books one of the things that's really clear is that they're saying that they're going somewhere but you can see that once they once they get down there they are basically cruising around getting the best prices and someone's just put that in the chat like what's the deal with the prices um so so much of this is tied to what's going on with the market for sugar at this time um and so you know when the sugar like price drops you know there's the the, the price of the horses is connected to that and you know, if there's a flood of horses coming in from New England, which which happens, you can see that they're like, all right, well, we'll go from Barbados, we'll move around here, we'll move around here. And the primary sources that talk about the prices that are really interesting are the letters between their agents, you know, down in the West Indies and the merchants back in New England. And they're like, look, just keep keep sailing around until you get the best prices for the horses. So they're not necessarily always telling the truth when they're leaving Rhode Island about or Connecticut or wherever it is, where they're going. And they're definitely cruising around trying to get the best price for those horses. Um, and there's definitely money to be made. So a lot of the time, I'm speaking to the question in the chat asking about the, um, you know, what's the deal with the, the cost of the horses, right? Um, the price that they're paying here is they tend to do bulk buys. So if you remember back to the advert that I showed, right, that they're, you know, they're looking for a bulk number of shipping horses. So they'll buy, you know, 20, 30, 40 shipping horses and they get, tend to, you know, get them at a deal. I'll show you a particular example um, of the prices here. Let me show you Melbourne. Uh, let me go back to screen sharing. Um, So this basically says that look, um, this is from his uh, account book in in the in the mid seven the mid eighteenth century. He's buying thirty horses, right? And this is how much he's paying per horse, so just over eleven pounds. And this is you know what he's paying in total for thirty horses. Um, I know from um, tracking Malbone's letters and correspondence, he is making significant profit on that, even if the um the ship has to go to multiple stops he's he's making that money on it and so it's hard to say you know what to price because it really does vary quite rapidly depending what's going on for the market of sugar but the the point i will make to the person in the chat is that there's always profit to be made they always need horses carol wants to know how long a horse might actually last in a tropical environment like that yeah, not very long. Um, it's really depressing. Um, so there's a real hierarchy, actually. So and you see that start on the ship. So the riding horses that are being specifically imported 
two specific planters, the Narragansett Pacers, they are often treated way better on the ship and tend to live a lot better life once they get to the plantation. Um, they're given better food, they're just cared for better. And we see that transition from riding horses to coach horses as the 18th century progresses. You know, the plantations wreck the horses. Um, really a year or two at max is, is what I would say is a generalization. Uh, teams of plantations get through 10, 20, 30, 40 horses per year. Um, at times, um, you know, they tend to work overwork the horses. Um, disease kills a lot of the horses too. One of the most gruesome accounts I read actually was from a ship log book that was going to Suriname who all the horses got sick on the ship and only two out of the 40 made it to Suriname and the people in Suriname had to pass a special law that basically said they were getting so many dead horses arriving in Suriname from New England that there were just these dead horses floating along the shore and they passed a law that um, you would be fined if you didn't drag the horse into the into the desert and bury it that gives you a sense of the horses that are dying before they even get there. So disease, you know, animals, enslaved peoples um, as a form of resistance. Um, one of the things, this actually comes from Frederick Douglass in the American context is enslaved peoples sabotaging plantations as a form of resistance by attacking the animals, not caring for the animals. Um, and so, yeah, not very long is the honest answer because of disease, overwork, deliberate sabotage, um attacks by other animals so really it's that's why they constantly need animals coming in because the, the, the animals don't last that long mules tended to be hardier and last longer yeah, right. that, yeah. that that so there's always real desperation for mules but breeding mules is a problem because once you breed a mule right you breed a male horse with a, a, a male donkey with a female horse mules are sterile so that's it you can't breed from that animal um, and the male donkeys, the jacks, are so protected um, in parts of Europe, particularly France, in Morocco too, um, that it's really hard to get a jack to start a breeding program. And that only tends to come in the mid to late 18th century. And that's when they start yeah. breeding mules because the planters are right into New England all the time, like, stop sending us crappy horses, send us your mules. And they're like, we're trying. So you see the <laughs> diversification specifically based on, on export. That's what they say. Like, uh, I start my book chapter on mules with like a letter from planters in St. Eustatius basically saying, stop sending us cheap rubbish horses and send us more mules. So how'd they feed the animals once they got there? Once they landed in, in the sugar colonies, they're importing a lot of the grain too, right? Like that's that's what's happening. Yeah. Um, you're not going to grow hay. In, I mean, some places do grow hay um, in, in the Caribbean and some places do have limited pasture. You see that more in Jamaica rather than the other sugar colonies. But a lot of that grain is being imported again from New England down to the, to the animals there. And every bit of the horse is used. So one of the things they use is the manure, the dung from the horses is used as a fertilizer. So the horses are not just useful for like doing the work but the the manure they produce is is used too uh yeah i see a question from from bob uh yes i was just trying to um uh keep this get this straight i mean so the horses came from england and they were shipped over to new england and from there they were bred and shipped to other places is that the the main yeah uh, in in the early 17th century initially horses right. are imported uh from right. England. And um i'm sorry go ahead um, oh yeah no you go ahead I, I was gonna ask uh did they come from any place in particular from in england or did that really matter yeah so the initial horses come from leicestershire um which is in the east midlands it's a big horse um breeding hub um they also import horses from spain in the 17th century uh, and do some cross breeding too um there's a great book that i would recommend on horse breeding in england by well there's several books by a historian called peter edwards who's written a book called the horse trade of early modern england um horses and the aristocratic lifestyle in early modern england he's written several books on on horses in early modern England and he's been a great mentor to this research certainly when I started out um 
and so they're coming from there um and england think about what's happening in england right the colonies over here right we have plymouth start in 1620 massachusetts bay is 1630 rhode island 1636 uh, and then obviously connecticut and new haven play out too england in the mid 17th century has a civil war right where they chop their king's head off and the cavalry is central to that and so england does not necessarily by the mid 17th century when the english civil war plays out have the enough horses to keep sending and so that they've already sent some horses in the 1630s before the civil war kicks off and so it leaves New England in this prime position in the mid 17th century where England's kind of screwed after the Civil War um, to be able to be breeding these horses for export because, you know, they've not needed a cavalry. They've not just had, had a civil war in New England. And again, geographically speaking, it's easier to ship horses from here like a, a month down than send them from England, even if there were enough horses to ship. Does that it's make sense? A brutal trade, though. I mean, it's a brutal trade. The more you think about it, the more you, you describe it. Um, yeah, I suppose it's not surprising if you treat human beings as badly as 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 enslaved peoples were treated, that they're going to treat animals just as bad. Uh, did you let me ask you this in the log books that you reviewed or in your research? Was there seasonal shipping in particular? I mean, this is a highly risky sort of a thing to ship a deck cargo of horses from New England to the West Indies. You know, you had to do it at a certain time when you would anticipate the weather to be relatively yeah. benign. Yeah, they do. Um, and again, looking at the case studies of like, you know, I picked a handful of New England merchants to do a deep dive into. And um, and, and a lot of the time it is seasonal, but not always, right? Like right. if the sugar colonies are like, we desperately need our horses and they're right in like our plantation stand still because we we can't grind the sugar huh. so if they're saying like look we desperately need some horses they'll they'll send them when that need is and um, they try to keep it seasonal but that's not how it plays out all the time is that right reality. really yeah yeah i mean if they need the animals they need the animals right 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 you had so, another question bob say that again oh nothing i thought bob raised his hand again well uh uh, yes, I, I do. I was going. Uh, the other question I had was um, about when did um, uh, the importing of the horses uh, and uh, you know either draft horses or the riding horses become um, more of a thing in New England for you know for New England rather than just for um, shipping to the West Indies. So just say that again. Sorry, you're asking when. Well, uh, yeah, I I'm. I gather that a lot of the horses they got were shipped, you know, were bred and then they shipped to the West Indies. But when did horses for riding, uh, what were there any did that become important? It did, um, absolutely. At, at what, or, or at the same time or in New England? Yeah, that's such a good question. So really from this, the same time they're breeding horses for export, they're breeding horses for riding here too. They, they need them. Um, it starts in the mid to late 17th century. There's there's two distinct breeding things going on, right? Breeding mainly horses, draft horses for export, but simultaneously breeding and riding horses to keep here in New England, as well as export some of them. That's where the Narragansett Pacer comes from. Um, so, you know, horses are, are really interesting. You know, they're not necessarily in the early days, Um Sorry, um, we've just got kitchen activity going on behind me. I apologize for the um for that. Um there, you know, horses aren't necessarily there's a reason why Plymouth doesn't bring them in 1620, right? Like that's that's really interesting to me. Because, you know, obviously being so close to the water, they can use machines, canoes, they can use travel on foot on the indigenous paths. Uh, but really, as they start to expand, riding horses become necessary. What's fascinating is that it truly is just riding horses until we push into the 18th century, where they start to then have a secondary use as they're starting to build roads, right? And roads are, are, are more smooth. They're then breeding horses to pull carriages. Um, and so there's a different breeding process. And then the really rich people don't get their horses for carriages in New England. They import them from England with a man matching fancy carriage. Um, so they they are needing riding horses from, from the get-go. And that's why horses like the Narragansett Pacer are so important because they can cover 
really rough terrain without getting tired both themselves and their rider so yeah they are really riding horses too to keep keep some here just not draft horses hmm. just a word on sloops they you know the sloop rig could was extremely versatile rig so it could be anywhere from you know from a 40 foot vessel to uh you know almost 80 feet so you know a deck load of horses on you know uh, on a sloop and they you know those those things i call i call them the f-350s of the 18th century you know these are the you know these are these are the, the big heavy pickups they're not the you know they're not they're not they're not a they're not a brig they're not a ship but they're everything else and you know you could you know anybody that could afford to you know, if you if you could afford to build you know a 40 foot sloop you could trade you know coastwise and make some money and 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 go up you know sort of from there so you know the sloop rig was just such a versatile rig ooh narragansett pacer yeah, I just I'm letting you know my dog is eating his dinner that's uh, the sound you can hear behind I apologize um so yes, what where can we learn more about the Narragansett Pacer? So um, I publish, let me screen share. I publish the this article in Rhode Island um, History Journal um, in 2018. Um, the front cover says shipping horses, but it's that's not what it's about. It's about the article inside is the rise and fall um, of the Narragansett Pacer. So if you send me an email, I'll send you a copy of the journal article. Um, the other way to learn about the Narragansett Pacer is um, we are hosting the Equine History Collective Conference on the Roger Williams University campus. Um, the last weekend of September, the first weekend of um, October, and we have a big public history event on the Thursday night, so Thursday the 28th of September, and I'll put the link in the chat to the conference, where we're partnering with Rhode Island Historical Society and the public history event is Equine History in the Ocean State. And I'll be talking about the Narragansett Pacer specifically, along with, you know, other equine history stuff. Um, so feel free, I'll put my email, I'll, if you um, stay on at the end when we stop recording I'll, I'll put my email there um, and you can just google me and look me up Charlotte Carrington Farmer uh, you'll see my email there and I can I can send that to you um, I will put the Equine History Collective website for the conference here the public history event hasn't gone live yet but it will be going live in the next 24 hours so that will go out soon hey Charlotte I, I've heard that Robert E. Lee's famous horse traveler had uh had uh bloodline narragansett uh narragansett pacer bloodline is that true Do you know? i mean i i don't know i say i don't know i'm smiling because i have um there's a master's student called alan horn who just finished his master's thesis at the university of maine who is presenting on this issue at the conference and i was the external examiner for his master's thesis like i don't know three or four weeks ago and this was one of the questions that we talked about about traveler um you know it, it's debatable like you know the narragansett pacer is is a slippery animal um you know one of the other kind of rumors about it is that Paul Revere rode an arrogant oh. pacer on his midnight ride. And spoiler alert for my article is I don't think he did. If he did, <laughs> it was likely um, a crossbreed, uh, a true arrogant pacer paces, right? It doesn't gallop. And in the letter that Revere writes to Jeremy Belknap all those years later, he's like, you know, that, that horse galloped. So a true pacer wouldn't be doing that. And then you know, one of the British um, army officers takes that horse from Revere and swaps it because it's a bigger horse and paces were small so by that point you know in the 17 like by that point in the late 18th century they'd started to crossbreed paces to have a more versatile horse so it was probably a half breed but perhaps the most famous pacer story is george washington is a huge fan of them and corresponds with breeders in Rhode Island and Connecticut about getting the best Narragansett pacers so you know traveler I'm not sure like maybe by that point that's late so it's right, that's know, civil, civil war but I mean it's a famous yeah. famous horse I mean it was famous at the time it was a famous horse. oh yeah it's huge and there's been a bunch of work on traveler and again if people are interested I can hook them up with that but yeah, yeah. the Narragansett pacer is on its way to extinction by that point so my guess is it's you know i don't want to say it's unlikely it's not my research but you know probably across some version maybe 
Charlotte, you're brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a oh. great. Uh, this was a great evening. Um, yeah. And we, you know, I, I love the mar. I, I love to, you know, I love to hear fresh maritime history, uh, and it is fundamentally a maritime history story. Um, it, at as a as a as a means, you know, all of you know, so many of these, uh, so many of the the, the business aspects of life in the new world you know enslaved people sugar uh rum uh you know growing food that was all enabled through the atlantic world uh and uh, and so that we're that's a big part of what the local history guild is about is about these maritime stories so thank you so much for for coming out this evening and uh it, it was just it was a real delight um uh, in October, uh, we're going to review uh, the new exhibit here at the museum, All Hands, uh, Yankee Whaling in the U.S. Navy. Um, so that's uh, that's coming up in October. Um, I'm going to see if I can talk Bob Madison into uh, into joining me in a conversation uh, that evening. Uh, 